it's the first time at the Wisher Fest that we um, actually address the question of social impact. So I'm very impressed and very happy. Please take a seat. Do you have some seats like in the front and also in the back? Thank you. Um, so the question is really uh, hard and we have only a few time. So um, Kushbo introduce you very quickly. So I will just go directly to the question. So just about the topic, we phrase it like, is the collaborative economy um, for only like educated and urban middle class people? Actually, we can also rephrase it in another way is, who do we serve, really? Who are the users of the collaborative economy? For this first question, I will, do we have another micro? Yes? Yes, please. So I will ask Helen from Nesta. Nesta carries a few research on the question, on many, many questions. Could you please give us a few insights about who actually are the user of collaborative services? We are, yes, okay. So um, Nesta's undertaken um, some research over a number of years, I think, um, into the collaborative economy. Um, more recently, two kind of representative surveys based in the UK. So um, the results that we have are based on UK population, but one's intuition would tell you that in certain European countries you might see similar things. Um, so um, if we define what we mean by participating in the collaborative economy as being using a digital platform to share or exchange something, whatever that is, with someone that you probably don't know. Um, then our research tells us that the, the in terms of demographics, you see um, mostly 24 to 34 year olds as being the dominant users, which is probably completely unsurprising. It's probably also unsurprising as well that as soon as you reach 55, and we did a bucket that actually put 55 plus, which means that you know we didn't really differentiate too much, which being close to that age, I feel a little bit sort of, um, worried about that would be compared to a 90 year old. But um, so, you know, you see it significantly drop off and that's sort of unsurprising. You also see a fifth of the people that we, uh, that in our sample um, of users were ABC1, so the highest demographic of users and people who were, as I say, pensioners, unemployed, underemployed, semi-skilled uh, or ethnic minorities, way, way lower levels of participation in that particular thing. So. Um, in our other, both of our sample surveys gave us um, a consistent message was that there's about a quarter of the UK population that have engaged in some way in sharing and exchanging something um, through a digital platform with someone they don't know, which feels sort of quite high. If we think of 20% as being the kind of going mainstream, then that feels good. But actually, if you dig deeper, you find out something very different, which is that if you strip away um, users who are using eBay and Craigslist and Gumtree are selling something online, um, you get a very, very different picture. So um, the percentage of people who have actually used the internet to uh, share a room, rent a house, exchange or share a piece of equipment, that way drops down to 1%. 1%. If you're looking at skill sharing, exchanging skills and time through these kinds of marketplaces, it goes up a little higher to sort of 4 or 5%. But I think, so the question about, is it for educated and urban middle classes only? I don't know that we can know that. You're talking about super early adopters. And although my instinct would tell me that there are some dynamics at play that would tend toward preferring and privileging a certain members of the community, actually, you would expect in an early adopter phase for it to be perhaps this kind of demographic. So um, not to say that there isn't a problem, but I think it's probably a little bit early to make any rash judgments about that. Okay, thank you. Uh, actually, uh, yes, the question is really, it's in this uh, phrasing, it's really hard to answer like this because the collaborative economy, it, the word, this expression represents so such a diverse reality. So that's why we have on stage actually a few people representing the diversity of the collaborative economy. So I will ask Shelby, as the CEO of Peers, uh, you're an entrepreneur in the collaborative economy. How do you see this question? Is it like a target to target other people? Hello? Okay, great. <clears throat> uh, so uh, I'll add on as well that I'm, so I, I'm 
currently the CEO of Peers, um, and Peers is creating products and services to support uh, sharing economy workers. Um, but in addition, um, I also founded a company called Relay Rides. So Relay Rides is the largest peer-to-peer -peer car sharing platform uh, in the United States. Um, so uh, I bring in sort of like two hats. Uh, one is now thinking about um, the workers of the sharing economy and sort of helping to uh, understand and identify um, sort of the vulnerabilities they have as independent workers and trying to address those. Um, but I previously, uh, you know, uh, founded and, and operated, uh, you know, one of the sharing economy platforms. And so I you know, bring in a little bit different perspectives. Um, so, uh, you know, it's not surprising to hear uh, the results of, um, uh, uh, of the survey that you did. Um, essentially, it, they look like early adopters. I mean, that's sort of just the classic profile of an early adopter. Um, it sort of goes along with, you know, the title of this as well. You know, early adopters tend to be, you know, relatively educated and usually live in cities. So, you know, it's, um, it's not surprising at all to see that, you know, that's sort of um, been the, um, uh, the predominance of, uh, of users to date. Um, at Relay Reds, I will say, though, that we did see, uh, you know, a larger proportion of, um, uh, of retirees and pensioners, as you said, um, than we expected. Um, you know, I think that, uh, you know, basically people are, um, you know, retirees, they, they tend to be a little bit more um, judicious with their, uh, with their funds and their money. And so uh, the ability to offset the costs of owning a car by letting somebody use it whenever they're using it anyways, um, that really resonates with people. And so um, you know, we were su surprised to see, you know, we saw a, a sort of a higher proportion um, of, uh, you know, of those users. Um, to me, the question is, it, you know, what does this look like now, but what will it look like? Um, and you know, I'm optimistic to see that this will cross the chasm um, you know, from just the early adopters, um, and it will start to appeal to you know, different demographic classes. Um, you know, the ability to earn income on your own terms, it's, you know, it's, it's flexible and it's empowering. So, um, you know, these are sort of universal truths that I think will, um, uh, you know, um, uh, that will appeal to, you know, to, to many people. Um, you know, but uh, as a, uh, you know, as a company and as a, you know, having operated, you know, relay rides, um, you know, we're going to go with a path of least resist resistance. So, you know, as opposed to, uh, you know, trying to target you know, the rural and lower class, um, it's not that we don't want those people. It's just that, you know, we're operating a business. Uh, we need to grow the business. And in order for the business to, to be successful and have an impact, we have to have a successful business. Um, and so, you know, I believe strongly that the collaborative economy, uh, you know, represents, um, you know, great possibility for, for social change. Um, you know, I, I believe that many of them have, you know, a, a strong alignment between purpose and profits. Um, that's to say that the more successful the business is, um, the, the greater the impact uh, the business will have. Um, and so I think it makes sense for the businesses to start off by focusing on, uh, you know, the, the demographics that are going to be sort of the, um, you know, the, uh, the easiest to adopt, the most sort of financially attractive. Um, from there, uh, you know, I think that, uh, that it's going to spread. And hopefully, you know, that will start to include, um, you know, uh, people outside of this just, you know, simply, you know, uh, 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 you know, sort of early adopter class. Um, the other way that I think that that sort of impact or, you know, sort of the, uh, the, the demographic spread could be accelerated um, is if there are sort of, um, you know, uh, other factors that make you look to other places. So, for example, um, you know, uh, if governments wanted to create subsidies or, or grants, um, that would encourage companies to expand or focus on uh, rural or lower income uh, populations that would make sense to do so. You know, that might make sense in terms of transportation, um, you know, or, or other things. If you, uh, you know, if you can sort of um, expand that out, um, it's just not going to be sort of the, the places that businesses are going to uh, to go to first. Okay, thank you. Uh, actually, I'd like to to ask to Kathy because you have also like uh, two different hats. Yes, um, Shelby just say that. In his opinion, to go to this public, it will need to grow businesses. And I think that your activities are directly linked with people who are not really usually users of this kind of service. So, can you explain us what you do, both with L'Africaine d'Architecture and also Rulab? Okay. Um, what we try to do at the beginning with L'Africaine d'Architecture is what we call um, modernity roots. The idea is to learn from traditional architecture and use uh, the potential of traditional material, traditional aesthetic, uh, even traditional dynamics and traditional people to build new, very modern architecture. 
and um, at the beginning I was not interested at all in technology because all this uh, way of thinking led to uh, building earth, earth architecture, uh, etc. But uh, I have a problem because I can't do this uh, modernity route or neo vernacular approach in the city because um, the, the things that make it work in the village is that they have some um, some ritual, some moments, and some space like uh, uh, initiation, uh, initiation space who people can meet, uh, learn from uh, one another, and uh, who young girls and boys can be trained to what they will do after. And in the city, we don't have um, the space and we don't have moment like ritual moments. And when I discovered the, what they call uh, maker movement, I see something that we can use in the city to have the same we have in the village. You can use camps, like bar camps, to recreate these uh, uh, ritual moments. And we can use labs, like fab labs, to create space people can uh, use to work together and try to begin to change their, their city. So the idea is to create camps and labs and, and replicate camps and labs to help city to be in the capacity to do the same thing like uh, in village. And the first camp, we, uh, the first lab we create is WellLab, which is now a space with about 30 uh, young girls and boys who work together. We have, we don't have any engineer in uh, our community. We have about 30% um, girls and tailors, uh, masson, uh, uh, even one homeless, uh, one boy who, who used to sleep in front of the lab and he, he tell them to come to the lab. So it is not a community like you can see in the classic tech hubs. Uh, it's, uh, it's open for everyone. And even our startup are open. Every, everyone can come and work for, for, for our startups. So the interesting point is that you started from the people and then you build the tools. And actually, it's maybe also a way to have these people who are usually left aside because they're not early adopters and then maybe don't have this culture. And I think that, Emanuele, you have an interesting point on this question because you are also like two caps. You wrote a thesis on participatory democracy, and you also are you are also the co-founder of uh, Labelle. Yes. So can you tell us a little more about how we can involve people with, with the question of open democracy? Because we're not in a like bottom uh, up, but not, no, the, yeah, bottom up, but like the the reverse. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Uh, so first of all, like. Uh, Thank you all, like that was like fantastic intervention. So like my name is Manu, I am the co-founder of Babele, which is uh, like a, we are open sourcing the business model of social entrepreneurs. And uh, so like it's pretty much a crowd accelerator for impact with uh, stakeholders from 88 countries. And uh, like uh, when I like read this question, like I was really like, oh my God, what am I gonna say? <laughs> but uh, you know, like I really, I, li I love taking case studies and the kind of case studies I took, it was the one of co-workings. Why co-workings? Because I really believe co-working like are the fundamental pillar like for the sharing economy. Like in every place I've been where there was a co-working space, like the people were much more aware about what was happening like uh, about the sharing economy and about like old trends that where the co-working was in fact missing like uh, they were like uh, much less talking about this kind of things. So I live in Bucharest at the moment, despite like I'm Italian. And in Bucharest, three million, pe three million people, there are three co-working spaces. And what two of them are working pretty well, and one is pretty empty yet. So, but why a co-working space like until now, like makes sense for these uh, urban, uh, like middle class uh, educated people? Because like in a city, you can actually like, uh, the, you can have the meeting between the demand and the offer to make uh, a co-working sustainably, like an, in, an interesting, like uh, a sustainable business, which is like still very tough, but uh, it becomes very difficult, like though, like to imagine set the same model applied in the middle of the countryside, like uh, where you got, uh, like I come from Sardinia, like in a people with, with in a village from with 8,000 people and 15,000 sheep, like, uh, and uh, like, uh, just you know, just to tell a story, you know, like we did a, a, a social innovation workshop, you know, like to get, to collect money, like for the uh, ice ice bucket challenge against LSA. So like we were gathering like uh, crowdfunding, and then we would reinvest it like uh, in research. 
Like we did like one of these courses in the little village with more sheep than people, and one like in the capital of Sardinia, like where there was a co-working space. So in the first case, we just had these random people from 50 to 70 that had no idea what we were talking about. We started looking at all the challenges, all the social innovation, and for them it was all completely new. In the co-working space, not many kilometers away, like from the small village, everybody knew about everything. You know, we had this kind of amazing and like pumping audience that was really participating all the time. But uh, how can you make that co-working like in a small village? And I got like the right example. Like everything is based on the business modeling. Like if you try, it, like our society is still unfortunately based on this profit and loss account mentality. And so like it would be very difficult to bring a co-working in a place where like it was not built yet because the opportunity to meet the demand and offer is like tougher. Uh, and in a more small municipality in Sweden with whom we are actually collaborating, they are, they are called Vålerim. It's an 800 people fraction, so they do not have a municipality. And those people, like they are in Lapland, like uh, so in Laponi, like they are really like uh, far, far north. And uh, they actually like invented this new model in which the entire municipality is creating co-owned social businesses and so, for example, they created a co-working with 100 co-owners to offer to their, to their kids, you know, one of those third spaces where they could have actually, like, uh, collaboratively innovate. They did, like, an incubator. I'm talking about an 800 people village. They did, like, a hotel altogether. So, like, it's interesting because uh, this kind of cooperative kind of business model enabled uh, a dispersed peripheral village to actually, like, build uh, like the base actually for the sharing economy in a place where otherwise nothing would have ever grown. Thank you for this example in the sheep. <laughs> <laughs> because actually the, the whole question is, okay, if we want to serve older people, who are these older people? We have actually what we call the, ba the bottom of the pyramid, so the people who are usually really left aside, the poorest socio-democratic, uh, demographic, sorry, group. Then we have the people in, in rural places, we have the people uh, like they are older than um, 50 uh, age and, and plus. So the question is, okay, we know today that we have like more early adopters than a wide, like wider audience. So the question is, how do we move forward from this point? And actually, do we have to, does collaborative economy have to serve these people because we have social businesses using collaborative patterns, but those the collaborative economy has to solve these problems, and if yes, how? So I'd like to have your point of view, uh, namely regarding the, the question and the fact that we have today a lot of big companies in the collaborative economy, and these big companies, usually they cannot actually serve these people. So how is it going to, to wh what is going to happen in the future if we have only these such big companies? And maybe it could be also interesting to have your point. So is there another way of businesses to build this kind of answers? I'll go first. It is sort of, um, that's a long question. <laughs> I know. There. So I will um, answer it in three ways. There's three points to make probably. The first is that um, I don't believe it's the truth, it's the truth that you need to ghettoize people with different platforms because you think they need, you need to serve them in different ways. So there shouldn't, you know, it's upsetting that there should be perhaps an Airbnb for a different section of society. That's just absurd. And so um, just to say that it is, they are for everybody. It's a question of inclusion. The set, and related to that point is, of course, is that even though they might not be using those platforms at the moment, uh, most of the dominant sharing economy platforms will know who is using their platform. And whether or not they choose to share the data, they will know the sex, the name, the uh, location, uh, the probably by inference the demo socio demographic of those people, and therefore probably well able to tell you whether they're underserving large parts of their population. So um, the question is uh, for me about how willing and able are some of the dominant platforms to share their data. That would be so interesting. You see movements toward that, but um, commercial sensitivity is often you know a key barrier. The second thing is to get to a different place. You probably need to. Um, I guess my sort of personal mission over the next 24 months is going to be increasing the flow of social finance towards these things. So there's, you know, um, we know $10 billion worth of VC went into this just in the US last year. 
you know, um, wouldn't it be lovely, wouldn't it be brilliant to match that in some way in terms of social finance where you're looking at real mixed motive investment, monetized platforms possibly, but, you know, with real kind of focus on social and environmental impact as a key investment model. And the third thing is that the innovation opportunity that's being missed in part is the relevance to public services and charitable missions. So um, in the UK, at least, we have you know, a pretty dire state of affairs when it comes to our economy, and public sector funding has been cut dramatically. Um, and yet, there are some really good sharing economy models that address those things. We see peer-to-peer -peer meals on wheel services. We see things like um, Shared Lives Plus, which is a fantastic, I mean, it's, um, it's the sharing economy at its most heartfelt, it's taking very, very um, disadvantaged and people with learning disabilities, very vulnerable members of our society who would ordinarily be in a care home, an institution that probably doesn't serve them very well and is probably very expensive to run, and matching them through marketplaces with people who want to foster and have those people with them in their homes. Now, that is hugely successful at the moment. It's scaling really well in the UK, it's much cheaper and you get better outcomes. So that kind of model, the way in which policymakers and public sector officials and leaders need to think about the way in which the principles of the collaborative economy apply to some of our most pressing challenges is the key innovation opportunity for the next couple of years, I think. Thank you. Um, I guess I just wanted to, um, to make a point. Um, you know, the collaborative economy is still quite young. Um, you know, uh, Airbnb really got going in, what was it, 2009? It may have been founded in 2008, but 2009 was its first year of real, uh, you know, uh, real, real scale. Really Rides launched in 2010. Um, you know, Uber was 2009. Lyft was 2012, I believe. Um, you know, most of these companies are still really quite young. Uh, and it's sort of staggering to think of, you know, the, the progress that's been made in, in these short years. You know, I remember I came up with the idea for Really Rides in 2008, and people just looked at me like I was crazy. You know, like, do you want a stranger to drive my car? I don't let my husband drive my car. <laughs> um, and uh, you know, now we have look at all the people that you know have that have showed up that that understand and recognize the value of these platforms. So um, I guess it's to say that I think that there's a long and prosperous road in front of us. Um, and uh, you know, so um, I, I think. Uh, as we travel down that road, we will we will see more inclusiveness. I think that um, you know we're seeing more and more uh, you know platforms that are popping up every day, um, and it's not to say that there's you know that the, there needs to be sort of a, an Airbnb for low income you know or or, or something along those lines. But um, I think that we're going to continue to see more and more marketplaces. Um, hopefully, uh, it moves up the chain as well, right? So as opposed to just having commoditized labor, um, you know, we find ways to have peer per marketplaces for more skilled labor. Um, and you know that could uh, you know actually create sort of a, a career tra trajectory. You know, you start off with something that's more com you know uh, uh, a less skilled labor, maybe cleaning or, or driving, um, and that you know uh, it, you have multiple sources of income. Um, your real passion is uh, you know violin or something like that, and you're able to, to leverage this, start uh, using another one of the platforms, take lessons perhaps um, to start you know sort of uh, tutoring violin on the side, and then you know maybe you you open up sort of a, your own um, actual physical uh, school. So, um, you know, I, I think that um, it, that it, in time we're going to see, uh, you know, a, a much broader inclusion and sort of uh, unnaturally rushing that, um, I think will put the businesses at risk. You know, it, it, the exception of, uh, you know, if, you know, the, the UK is going to come up with $10 billion uh, um, or anyone's going to come up with, with that amount of money to, to invest in sort of, uh, you know, expanding or, or sort of you know, changing the economics to make people, um, uh, invest in different areas, you know, and, and I don't think that would be crazy, to be honest. You know, if you look at sort of the, um, you know, in transportation, uh, I think transportation is a good example to think about because uh, billions of dollars does go into the transportation sector, um, and uh, you know, through through public transit, and you know, I'm not saying that public transit, you know, isn't valuable, but um, if you're looking at, uh, you know, how people are getting around town, um, and where public dollars are going. Um, I think there's a big mismatch. Um, you know, there's an enormous number of people, you know, at least, so I live in San Francisco, um, and, you know, Uber, Lyft, Sidecar, you know, there's a number of, of, uh, of, of peer to peer ride sharing companies um, that have, you know, formed a very, very reliable form of transportation. Um, and it's not just individual rides anymore. You know, you're, you're now going to shared rides through Lyft Line and Uber Pool. Um, Lyft is doing some interesting things. They've created these hotspots. So essentially, uh, you know, these are just sort of local aggregation points. 
Um, and whenever you go to these local ag aggregation points, it's, it's more likely there's going to be people traveling in similar directions. So, um, you know, and, and the rides are a lot cheaper then. So I think it's, you know, at half price where they have, they have uh, they, for a while they had rides at $2, which is on par with public transit. Um, and so, you know, you're having sort of instant sort of personalized public transit for people through some of these different um, uh, uh, transportation platforms. And so um, I don't think it's crazy for governments to be thinking about um, investing, uh, subsidizing, funding some of these, um, some of these new platforms. Um, and I think that really would expand the, uh, the access. But, um, you know, uh, naturally, I think that we're going to see it happen anyways. Thank you. Actually, um, Manili and Kofi, you already gave examples on something happening today. So my question for you, Bob, is how we can make this project first more visible and also maybe to scale them or like to duplicate them in somehow in some way. Maybe Kofi first, can you just give us some idea how we can what you do there, can we have it here in France or duplicate in other countries? Maybe because you talk about modernity rooted, so it's really specific to one place. How we can like have these solutions in other places as well? Uh, I will be very prudent on this uh, this approach. I don't think uh, everything can can be replicated. It is a it is it is a is a, uh, an, an approach. So if you want to do the same here, uh, you need to make everything from the beginning. You can, can just take the, the, the project as uh, it is now and try to, to put it here in France. There is no, no sense. You need to, to have the same approach and uh, it is an anthropological approach because uh, in uh, the um, collaborative economy, what, what we, 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 um, we hear in this term, there's a lot of uh, uh, cultural aspect in, you know. And uh, for us in Africa, we are, we are, um, we are societies, we are about 85% uh, informal, we are uh, uh, still very traditional, you know. So the uh, the, the sharing economy is not the approach for the, the sharing economy it can can't be the same like like here you know we, we are we, we are we are already in sharing economy but it is not it is just a, a habit a culture it's not a movement so the, the switch we have to do is to make it a, a movement and you have another challenge here in, in the West I think Um, so, like, I just wanted to add something to what you guys said. Like, I th also think that in order, like, for the sharing economy to thrive, then, like, you need to, uh, the services in the sharing economy need to be designed already, like, taking into account, like, the inclusion, like, of the other people. And sometimes, like, that doesn't happen, you know? So, like, the inclusion, like, it's really true. Then, like, of course, like, we are right now, in my opinion, face facing a lot of friction because, you know, the values of the sharing economy they are radically different than like many values of the previous economy. So like uh, all this idea of uh, why should I share my car or like why should I share my house? Uh, you know, of course there is a transition like uh, so that more and more people are actually like understanding what's the value proposition behind uh, like uh, this new kind of economy. Like and uh, for example, like we we were like facing a lot of friction like when we said to people you should open your business model and people said are you kidding me? That's taboo, you know, like that's something that it's like represented competitive advantage of an organization. And we said, uh, this is bollocks, you know, like you should open it up, you know, like get the crowd feedback and then like potentially like uh, it's through transparency that you can actually inspire other people and understand exactly how you can replicate something. Not everything has to scale, like not everything has to become a corporation. Simply certain ideas might simply might be re-implemented locally, just looking at what are the best practices that other, peop other people like can potentially take from other innovators that are like uh, really interested about the same topic. So like, I'm gonna give you just an another example. I love case studies. Um, so like, uh, there is this guy like called Jeppe, like, and uh, he's like a social innovator from Mexico that came to our platform and he wanted to, like, he's uh, really into sport, he does sport trainings, and he wanted to create uh, sport facilities in underserved uh, communities uh, in Nicaragua. And because, you know, he did a trip there, and then I said, oh my God, I need to do something about it. 
when it came like to the platform and he started writing his idea, like from a business sense, like or like from a strategic strategic sense, it didn't make any sense, you know. So like uh, we tried to bring as many commenters as possible, civil engineers, people there in Nicaragua, like and other people that were passionate about the project. And this guy, like from nothing, right now, like he got the authorization of the local government to start building the fa these facilities, and is running currently like a crowdfunding campaign, like for building the first football field. And that's something that happened because other entrepreneurs like share their knowledge and that's be and because like other people simply believe in what kind of problem it was trying to solve. So Thank transparency. You. Thank you. So transparency, leave time to time, being like very specific to your place, knowing where we are really now, who do we serve at the moment with some research as well. Thank you very much for this uh, first ideas and trails also to move forward. I'd like to take the yeah, I'm just checking the time. We have 10 minutes, I guess. Yes, so I'd like to take a few questions because really it's it's sort of like just an introduction. Maybe we can spend the whole afternoon actually talking about this question. So, yes. There are two questions. Please be really specific and, and short if possible. Okay, thank you very much for uh, doing this panel uh, about social uh, business. Uh, actually, I, I live in Brazil where 60% uh, of uh, the people are considered as poor from the lowest uh, social uh, classes. And uh, as you said, coffee, uh, people there already do uh, a, t a type of uh, collaborative economy because they share cars, they work together, so it's a kind of co-working, blah, blah, car, it always exists. It already exists and it has existed for a long time. So I was wondering if um, this, um, this, this uh, thing of bringing collaborative economy to the lower classes, is it more about empowering them to make them able to develop themselves uh, as entrepreneurs, their own solutions with the collaborative economy is more about empowering themselves than really uh, bringing it to them directly. I, I think that it, it should be maybe uh, dynamic from them, that they adapt it to their culture, to the way they live and to, to the way they, they interact uh, in, the, in, in their environment. Thank what you. do you think? Thank you. Um, well, I, I think you make a really good point. Um, you know, it's, and what I got from your comment is that these platforms are open to anybody. Um, and there's nothing to say that, uh, you know, people from any class can utilize these platforms right now. Um, you know, uh, of course, if we're talking about driving, you know, there's sort of a, a barrier, you have to own a car, um, or Airbnb, or one of these things, you know, you, you have to have, um, a, you know, an apartment that's, you know, sort of suitable to, to have other guests. Um, but, you know, if, if it's, a, you know, uh, if it's not quite as nice as a, you know, a, a big flat in Copacabana, um, it's probably going to be cheaper as well, right? So, um, you know, you're, you're going to be appealing towards a different consumer uh, who's looking for something that's more affordable as well. So, um, and then there are many other platforms as well where you don't have to have some of the capital investment. Uh, I'm not sure what's, what's made it down to Brazil quite yet, but, you know, there's a number of them in the U.S. Um, you know, TaskRabbit, Handy, HomeJoy, um, you know, there are many different opportunities for income. And so, um, you know, I, I, I think it's, um, these, are, these opportunities can be very empowering to people. Um, and so uh, maybe it's just an issue of sort of uh, awareness and advocacy and making sure that people sort of, you know, uh, in, in all areas and sort of uh, all walks are aware of them and able to take advantage of the, uh, the opportunity. Thank you. Would you like to add something about the question? Yes, I think um, the, the, the interest for poor people uh, with this uh, movement of collaborative economy is, yes, to help them uh, improve what they, they are they are, do, they are doing now without uh, um, ask them to change. You know, there, there are some tools now they can, they can use and make better what, 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 what they, they are doing. Yes. Thank yes. You. There was another question. I'd like a man, if possible, to say equity. Hello. As being from Brazil, I want to compliment her question. 
uh, it's all about this, about having poor people, rural areas that they are already doing all this sharing economy, but not digital sharing economy. And the thing is, if you're uh, if you talk about sharing economy, it's a, a lot of digital, and it, uh, you're not in, um, putting all these poor people and the older people into the sharing economy. And they, sometimes you need uh, service that's from the city, like traffic uh, information or bus schedule. That's all about uh, collaborating technologically. How can we make it? All these people that uh, you know, we know that a lot of them they have already mobile and technology, but we know that they don't use it a uh, hundred percent of how, how they could use it on other service. So how can you make it this sharing economy uh, a little uh, a mix of on and offline, and not just digitally? We know that somehow you know uh, one day it'll be all everything digital, but not just today, how can you make that spread better? Uh, mixing the digital and the not digital. Thank you. Uh, I'd like uh, Emanuele, maybe you can. Uh, you can just first, I don't know if uh, the collaborative economy is only digital. We talk a lot about digital things, but we have a wide range of services that are not digital. So maybe you can. Uh, uh, sure, definitely. Uh, I, as I was saying before, like with the first example of the co workings. You know, like in my opinion, everything should start first, like uh, with uh, you know physical interaction. So, like it can be a co-housing, or it can be a co-working, or it can be a fab lab, and these kind of places, uh, like in my opinion, are what they gather like most of the information that then like it can spread also to the digital platforms. But uh, it's really important to have a place where they first m the people can meet in person because the kind of engagement which is created like through only an online platform and then working in one is never going to be enough. Like uh, it's really important, like to combine online and offline, to like make sure that you get to an outcome which is better of any of the other option like taken alone. So that's the reason why I would say like uh, try to create a co-working, like try to invest on third spaces where people can actually meet and all this information can actually spread rapidly. Thank you. So uh, I'm actually going to challenge that notion. Um, you know, I do think that. Uh, one of the reasons why the sharing economy has grown so much over the you know the last couple of years is the um, uh, the sort of the expansion and proliferation of, of, of mobile technology and how it's become more accessible to people all over the world. Um, it, the uh, technology it brings people together. Um, it, it makes markets more efficient on a larger scale that's uh, that, than is possible offline. Um, also, uh, you, know, you talked a lot about the collaborative economy through informal sectors. Um, I think that you know that's uh, you know, obviously uh, you, know, you want this to be sort of as accessible and expansive as possible. But uh, a lot of these platforms uh, offer security through technology. So um, shared repu uh, reputation, for example, um, integrated insurance, um, and so you know I, I actually you know think that the uh, you know the technical side is really important, um, and you know would you know uh, would like to see. You know, I, I think that's a really criti critical component, and I, I wouldn't be trying to push people into more offline. Um, you know, the offline interaction, the community, I think, is something that's really important. But you know, finding ways to help you know those communities adopt technology, um, you know, I would say would be a higher priority in my opinion. Thank you. We will take the last question. Someone from here. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, my question is, I will. Go back to the main uh, issue, which is the collaboration economy for the educated urban middle class only, and how can you persuade people who are who are not very really, really willing to share things for profit or not profit? Okay. Does Thank anyone you. want to answer this question? The question is how we can uh, help people to join the movement, right? How we can convince them? Okay. Uh, I think Kofi already somehow like uh, gave an answer, saying that the sharing economy already exists in some places, but doesn't have this name. Uh, I think um, uh, people need examples, you know. And uh, uh, in our space, uh, for the first uh, the first month, the first eight month, we are um, offline. We don't have internet connection, but we create the first African 3D printer. 
but the the response to your question is for for us we we force everybody to share in our lab you are obligated to share even if you are just uh, a tourist if you come to well lab you ask you uh, how is your background if you are engineer you are obligated to make a course and teach what you know to the young girls and boys who are in this space. So it is a, a rule for the space to, to, to share. Thank you. We will take maybe a last question. The yeah, one last question. Yeah, it was here. One. Thanks, Benita, if you can pair and share. It's an observation and a question as someone who's a former broadcast journalist, but but actually, in many ways, do you not believe that, that really this is about representation in the media? Because, in fact, there are shiny examples. We've heard some from Helen. We've heard some from Emmanuel. There are many examples of where the sharing economy is reaching people from all classes and all demographics. But actually, what we need to do, I believe, is we need to be showcasing and demonstrating that these exist, because they do exist right across the world. So is it not more a question of how we engage with the media and how we promote these really positive solutions that are, in fact, representative of a true sharing economy? Thank you. Helen, a quick answer to that, which is just make it sexy. You know, everyone talks about VC and San Francisco and Silicon Valley and all the money and all the power and all... You know, there's a very kind of compelling, attractive story there. And sometimes when you're talking about, um, you know, a, a different kind of world of sharing, it just seems less sexy, it just seems less attractive, and so it is, it is a representational issue. Uh, might I abuse my position and ask Shelby a question? So, do you mind? Is no, that right? go ahead. Because I can't not with you on stage, actually. But it's sort of, you know, because the, the way in which you talk about... Um, uh, use of the sharing economy, collaborative economies being empowering and that there's a narrative there which is about micro-entrepreneurship and engaging in lots of different platforms and, and one of kind of um, skills building and career building and yet in the press, which is maybe just a press thing, we see um, that actually there's another narrative which is about more precarious forms of work, that these are jobs below the API, that this is kind of uh, representing a very fundamental shift in inequality. And um, as a representative of the CEO of Peers, what do Peers do, do to um, support or respond to that kind of that story? Um, well, I'm giving a talk tomorrow. I think it's at 10.45. Uh, so I'll, I'll, I'll talk a lot about this. Um, but uh, I do inherently believe that these opportunities uh, can be uh, incredibly empowering. I think they can be something that is a great tool for economic development. Uh, it can be a great way for, for people in income. Um, in fact, millions of people are now earning billions of dollars around the globe through these platforms. So I think it is a great opportunity. Um, that said, I think that what you're talking about is that there is also an opportunity for workers to be exploited, um, that these opportunities are, uh, are proliferating outside of their traditional safety net uh, associated with the job. So, uh, and that's sort of been accompanied with um, pushing the risk from the company to the worker. Um, and so I think that the ball's in the air in terms of, you know, is this going to be something that's good or something that's bad? And so we're trying to tip it. <laughs> we're trying to tip it in, in the direction of it, of it being something that's good. Um, and so what we're doing at Peers is, is we're trying to identify where uh, there are new vulnerabilities. Um, and we're trying to find market-based solutions um, to, to combat those. So uh, I'll give you an example. So Peers has developed a couple of, of financial products, insurance products. Um, you know, that, that help to reduce financial uncertainty, um, that help to provide more of that safety net that used to come from a job. Um, so one of those products is called Keep Driving. Um, it's a vehicle replacement product for ride-sharing drivers like Uber or Lyft. Um, and so, uh, you know, if, if a, um, a ride-sharing driver uh, is in an accident, uh, insurance will cover that. Their, you know, their car will likely be repaired. But what it doesn't cover is their lost wages during that time. And so that's what Keep Driving is, is geared at. So, um, uh, if you're in an accident and you're a Keep Driving member, uh, we give you a car for a month. Um, so during that, uh, usually in a month, that's about how long it'll take, three weeks to a month, to get your car repaired, get your insurance claim settled, and get you back on the road. Um, and so uh, as opposed to just, you know, if you really rely on that income, that could be devastating to not have that income during that month. Um, and so Keep Driving really addresses that. And we've seen some, you know, really, really fantastic stories of people who, uh, you know, would have been, you know, would have been out thousands of dollars, would have not been able to pay their rent 
um, you know, one gentleman uh, does this more or less full time, uh, and he was in an accident right before Christmas. And he describes how keep driving saved Christmas because he was able to earn six thousand dollars while uh, you know he was driving a keep driving car. And so uh, you know, this is this is one example. You know, here's this. You know, we're just getting started down this down this path of you know creating new sort of modern benefits for independent workers. Um, and I see a whole suite of products and services uh, you know that can support this worker. So. Um, we're very aware of um, uh, you know the um, sort of vulnerabilities in the fact that these could be um, you know this, this could lead to uh, you know people being exploited, and we think that um, uh, you know uh, there's there's more opportunity um, than there is sort of risk, and so uh, you know we're going to work as hard as we can to tip the ball in the right direction. Thank you, no problem. Actually, I didn't ask the question because there was a full session dedicated to it. But it's a good point also to explain that maybe to engage people when it's not like already existing, maybe we need to adapt, which is somehow like the, the service that we have and not completely create new platforms and new things dedicated to the poor. So that would be really strange, actually. So I would love to uh, have like a conclusion word, but I think my quick one like really like just a conclusion if there's anything that you'd like to add it's now or never share your skills share your knowledge keep sharing uh, it, it, it's just the beginning um, you know I think we have a great opportunity for for workers and for people all throughout the economy um, and I think it, I'm excited for all of the people that are gathered in this room um, I think that we can work together to tip the ball in the right direction Keep sharing. Thank you very much. Thank you for all of you.